Rock and roll icon Jerry Lee Lewis made history with his talents. After all, his nickname was The Killer for a reason. However, he could never reach the fame he truly deserved because his mistakes always followed him. And now that he's dead, everyone's remembering who he was until the last days of his life, including his own family. And finally, they opened up about what really happened to Jerry. What caused Jerry Lee Lewis's death? And how did he spend his last days? Continue watching to find out. Jerry Lee's childhood wasn't awful, but it definitely wasn't great either. He grew up poor in Louisiana, but that didn't stop his family from supporting his dreams. He started showing interest in playing the piano when he was nine, but since his family didn't have much money, he could only practice on his uncle's piano. That was only for a while, though, before his father, Elmo, did everything in his power to buy Jerry his own stark piano, and that was the beginning of his success. The first song he learned to play was Silent Night, but he was still very out of tune with the music. In order to get better, he sneaked into nightclubs and hid behind the bar so he could listen to Ray Charles, B.B. King, and Muddy Waters to take some notes. Jerry was raised to Christian gospel music, and he used to sing and attend a Bible institute. But after a while, Jerry wasn't the little innocent boy anymore. This new bad boy was causing problems left and right, and he was kicked out of the institute. One of the reasons for his expulsion was the fact that he'd play rock and roll versions of hymns in church. Many years after he left that institute and started his career as a singer, one of his old friends asked him, are you still playing the devil's music? To which Jerry replied, yes, I am. Am. But you know it's strange. The same music that they kicked me out of school for is the same kind of music they play in their churches today. The difference is, I know I am playing for the devil and they don't. Jerry left religious music behind and started exploring rock and roll. And after he dropped out of school, he could finally completely focus on his music. His father's great support continued to show throughout the years, especially when he sold 33 dozen eggs just to save enough money to get Jerry to Memphis to audition for Sam Phillips and Sun Records. And that was the right thing to do because it was how his whole career kicks started. When Jerry auditioned for Sun Records, the owner, Sam, wasn't even there because he was away in Florida. But that didn't stop the producer, Jack Clement, from recording some of Jerry's tracks, including his own composition, End of the Road. He then started working as a session musician for many popular artists, until one day Elvis Presley walked into the recording studio. Jerry's life changed at that exact moment. Jerry, Presley, as well as Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash all started a spontaneous jam session in the studio, while Perkins left the tape running. What was supposed to be unrehearsed and fun turned into a groundbreaking moment in history. These songs were put onto an album and released under the title Million Dollar Quartet. This was the push he needed. And a year later, he finally started having his breakthrough with his own singles. And it all went up from there. His most popular song was Whole Lot of Shakin' Going On, which had some provocative lyrics that shocked people. Some radio stations even refused to play it at first, but the fans loved it. And the girls went crazy. But Jerry wasn't known for his songs. It was his piano playing style that influenced generations and left everyone in awe. He used to bang the keys with his fist and elbows. He climbed the piano, kicked the stool over, and even once set the piano on fire. He reinvented the way rock and roll was seen, and showed the world that the piano was just as important as the guitar was in that genre. Even Elvis Presley said that if he could play the piano like Jerry, he'd quit singing right away. Well, not everyone has Jerry's crazy talent. When they look back on me, I want him to remember me not for all my wives, although I've had a few, and certainly not for any mansions or high living money I made and spent. I want him to remember me simply for my music, Jerry once said. During his lifetime, Jerry was known as The Killer, which is a pretty weird nickname if you don't know the meaning behind it. And despite what everyone thinks, he wasn't called The Killer for his great skills. Jerry was actually called The Killer since he was a child. It was a very common nickname to address people with, but the nickname really stuck with him when he tried to suffocate a grown man with his necktie when he was still in school. And it didn't help that Jerry used to keep a pistol in his pants all the time. I ain't no goody and I ain't no phony. I never pretended to be anything, and anything I ever did, I did it wide open as a case knife. I've lived my life to the fullest, and I had a good time doing it. Yeah, Jerry really didn't care about anything he did wrong, and his love life is proof of it. Everything was going great for Jerry until the news exposed his marriage to his 13-year-old cousin, Myra Brown, while he was 22, a marriage that happened when he was still married to someone else. Myra opened up about how Jerry had gone to Louisiana and came back with a marriage license for the two of them. He had taken a friend to pretend she was Myra and signed the marriage license application and brought it back home to Myra so they could get married. Saying she was shocked is an understatement. I looked at him and I said, Jerry, are you crazy? My daddy will kill you. And he said, oh no, he won't. Your daddy likes me and your mama likes me. I just kept telling him, they 
will kill you, Myra explained. The next day, he invited her to go to a movie, but instead, it was just another one of his plans to trick her into going to a preacher to get married. I guess he had it all set up. I was like a deer caught in the headlights. You just stare and wonder, oh my god, where am I? What's going on? How is this happening? She said. Her father didn't take it well and even wanted to chase Jerry down with a pistol. But when he went to Jerry's recording studio to confront him, the owner, Sam Phillips, managed to calm him down. Maybe Myra's father got over it, but the rest of the world didn't. While Jerry was traveling on tour, the press got a hold of this news. And in no time, the whole world learned that Jerry married his underage cousin. It all went downhill from there. His sales were dropped, his tour was canceled, and he was blacklisted from the radio. Jerry went from earning $10,000 a night to $250. Myra eventually divorced him, accusing him of adultery and but the damage was already done. The killer was now known as the man that married his own cousin. That's definitely not something people can get over. But that didn't bother Jerry or his next wives. He was definitely a ladies' man. He had seven wives his whole life, yet he didn't want that to define him. Sure, people know how talented he was, but they can't just ignore everything else he did in his personal life. Jerry said he wants to be remembered as a rock and roll idol, in a suit and tie, or blue jeans and a ragged shirt. I had a guy tell me once, a songwriter, that the only way he could write another good song was to go out and get him a new wife or a new girl friend and make his life miserable, Jerry said. The show. That's what counts. It covers up anything. Any bad thoughts anyone ever had about you goes away. Is that the one that married that girl? Well, forget about it. Let me hear that song. Despite all the controversy that followed him with that marriage, Jerry somehow managed to reinvent himself as a country artist. He got the second chance he worked so hard for, and he was eventually forgiven. However, he never got another hit single, though. But that was obviously expected. Jerry even found love and married Judith Brown, who was with him until the last days of his life. They first met in 2010 and started dating. Five months after, they finally got married in 2012. Even though he'd gotten married six times before, Jerry said this marriage felt right and like it was his first one. It was a little weird that Judith was first married to Jerry's cousin, Russell Rusty before leaving him to marry Jerry. But what's weirder is the fact that Rusty was Jerry's cousin slash ex-wife Myra's brother. We can't even keep up with all of that. But what matters is that Jerry was finally happy until he was announced dead by TMZ. The first death announcement was apparently fake and TMZ apologized for the fake report, but it took two days until the real news of his death was all over the news. Jerry died on October 28th at the age of 87. Just a week before his death, Jerry had been sick. Too sick to even attend the celebration of his induction into the Country Music Hall of Fame. This definitely worked worried everyone. Dear friends and fans in Nashville, it is with heartfelt sadness and disappointment that I write to you today from my sickbed, rather than be able to share my thoughts in person. I tried everything I could to build up the strength to come today. My sincerest apologies to all of you for missing this fine event, but I hope to see you all soon. And sadly, he died only a week after. His obituary noted that he died of natural causes and that he had been sick for years now, and he suffered from different illnesses that his doctors said should have killed him way earlier. They said that he abused his body so thoroughly as a young man, he was given little chance of lasting through middle age, let alone old age. It was also said that his wife Judith said that Jerry was ready to leave and be with Jesus even before he died. Lewis, though his voice and body were weakened by his injury and a recent stroke, seemed happy, content. If you asked him in his waning years what he hoped people would say about him, he had a simple answer. You can tell him I played piano and sang rock and roll. Jerry's life was full of ups and downs, but his talent was undeniable. After all, even Elvis Presley was jealous of him. He isn't only remembered for the great work he did, but he's also survived by his wife and all of his children. The way he played the piano made history and will continue to be an inspiration for people for a very long time. If you liked this video, make sure to watch this other one.